G'day and welcome to the channel. Do you ever wonder why you like one photo over another? Often it's just an instant immediate feeling. We either like it or we don't. Do you like this pink robin photo? If so, why? What is it that you like? Perhaps it's the color, maybe it's the lovely mossy perch, or is it the pose and the eye contact which draw you in and hold your attention? I believe it's a combination of reasons, but I believe the eye contact and the pose creates an intimate connection between the viewer and the subject. And that's ultimately what we're going for with photography. So in today's video, I'm gonna discuss the importance of eye contact and pose in creating great wildlife photos. I'll explain exactly what I believe to be good eye contact and what good poses are. I'll show you good and bad. I'll also explain how I select an image after a session. In last week's video, I asked if you could spot the difference between affordable gear and expensive gear. You did a good job of identifying which image was which. But what was interesting about that exercise is I got a lot of comments of people saying, I like the 7D image, I like the way that it looks. Got me thinking, why? Why do people prefer the 7D image to the 5D image? One's obviously worth a lot more and the other one's a lot cheaper. So a lot of it comes down to the pose, habitat and composition. The type of camera you have doesn't choose those things. The photographer does and the bird plays its part as well. This was confirmed when I got a really good comment from Royal Scanlon, I think it is. So he said, I realized how much the overall composition and the pose of the main subject in an image influences me. So he realized that it's actually the pose which influenced him more than the gear. And that's really important and that's so true. And I totally agree with him. If we were to analyze the photos that we like and asked why, I believe a lot of the time it will come down to composition, pose, eye contact and setting. Those things largely dictate whether you like an image or not. All right, let's actually define what I mean by eye contact or good eye contact. Basically, we want the bird's eye looking into the camera. We want to feel like the bird's looking at us and we're looking at the bird. That creates an intimate connection and that's what eye contact is all about. Let's do a quick test. I've put up two images on the screen of a pair of rainbow bee eaters. Same photographer, same gear, same perch, same light. The only difference is really the pose and the eye contact. Which image do you prefer? Maybe think why. What does the better photo have that the other one doesn't? I'm assuming that the vast majority of people actually prefer the image on the left. And that's the one I prefer and I'll tell you why. It's got good eye contact from both birds, that is they're looking at us. They're both looking the same way. I quite like the pose and the composition and it just works. Whereas the image on the right, the birds aren't quite looking at the camera, not giving us the best eye contact, and they're looking in different directions. For me, it just doesn't work. And it's just these small differences that can really make the difference between a good image and a great image. So it's up to us as photographers to figure out what works and what doesn't when it comes to eye contact and poses. Sometimes the only difference between images is the actual pose of the bird. You've got the eye contact sorted, now we need to sort out the pose. Look at this black wing stilt. I took a number of shots at the same location of this bird, all with good eye contact, but all three have different poses. Which do you prefer and maybe think why? My least favorite is the one on the left. The bird is just a little bit static and boring. It's a nice pose, but it just doesn't do a lot for me. The image in the middle has some great action. It's got its wings up and it's walking, and I really do like this image. And that was the one I selected first. But then the image on the right has grown on me. There's just something about it, something about the pose. It sort of made the bird elegant and it's looking over its shoulder. And when you look at the full image, the composition just seems to work. And I really do like this image. And it was actually my wife that spotted this image. She happened to be looking over my shoulder and said, oh, I really like that. And I hadn't given it too much thought, but it's definitely grown on me over time. So what these three examples show is that you can capture a lot of different poses in a very short amount of time. Just using a burst rate and high FPS far increases your odds of getting a pose that you like the more photos you take. And it's often that simple. This is a good time just to say, this is just my opinion. What I think makes a good image may not necessarily be what you think, and that's fine. We have to have diversity in photography. I'm just letting you know what I like when it comes to head angles and poses. And you may be able to implement some of these things in your own photography. But you don't have to have good eye contact and the best pose to create interesting images. Take a look at the Sherwater image, for example. And I really like this image. You've got the sort of the sun coming through the clouds. You've got all the birds migrating in the same direction. You've got the water. Just the overall scene works for me. And really, you've got no eye contact because the birds are so far away. I also really like the sharp-tailed sandpiper shot. We have zero eye contact because its eyes are closed and its head's going into the water. The feeding behavior and the reflection are extremely strong and they really help make this image a good one. So I'll be honest, I often get so caught up in trying to create technically excellent images that I miss more creative and interesting shots. 
and that's something I've been working on. So for example, I often used to overlook birds that had another bird behind them that were out of focus because I thought they were too distracting. You know, I'd always wait for the perfect pose and the perfect eye contact and often I would just miss images. I actually learnt a lot by going out with another photographer. My dear friend Matt and I used to spend a lot of time together and we'd go to these locations and we'd have a session photographing the same birds and at the end of the session he would have these really interesting compositions and amazing photos and I'd think, I was there, I didn't see these things. But with his trained eye he was able to spot these amazing compositions and he wasn't overlooking things that I was. So I've had to train myself and try to look at the bigger picture and just take lots more photos and try to be a little bit more creative. And by doing that, I've definitely learned a lot and I can thank Matt for that. So say, look at this purple swamp hen image I took recently in a video. I really like that out of focus bird. It sort of adds some balance and some context to the image. And this is probably an image I would have overlooked once upon a time. But for the majority of the shots that I take, if you look at my gallery, nearly all of them will have really good eye contact and a really good pose. And that's because I like those sorts of images and they work for me and people seem to like them as well. So if we have a look at the specific golden plover, we've got really good eye contact, it's looking at us, a great walking pose, so there's some movement, a side profile, it's well lit, a nice low angle, and overall the image does work for me. These are the images I'm trying to capture. So let's take a look at nine images I've taken of a hooded robin. We can see all nine shots have some sort of eye contact. We can see the eye in the birds, but some are definitely stronger than others. Perhaps have a look and see which one most appeals to you. There's two images I ultimately kept and processed. Can you guess which ones they are? All right, let's start by maybe eliminating the images first. So images one and four are instant deletes for me. The, the bird's looking away, it's not even looking at the camera. So I wouldn't even keep these images. So image number seven, the eyes actually, the head's turned inwards. We've got shadow over the eye, we can't make out the eye another one I would delete. Uh, number three, it's not too bad, but generally I find with songbirds and some perch birds, the front on view is often the weakest one and a side on one is much better. Number two, it's getting better, isn't it? The bird's slightly turning its head towards us and we've definitely got some sort of eye contact, but it's just not there. The bird's head is still away from the sensor and the bird's looking somewhere else. That leaves us with uh, five, six, eight, and nine. These four are definitely the strongest four in my opinion. But if we have a look at number five and nine, they're almost identical, and that's because they're only taken seconds apart. But again, we've got some eye contact, but it's just not right. We're just missing that slight head turn that'll make all the difference. So that leaves me with number six and number eight. These two are the ones I ended up keeping, and these two have what I would believe is good eye contact. That is, it feels like you're, the bird's looking at you. You've got an intimate contact. The head angle's good, so generally what we want is the head parallel to the sensor, so side on and just turning in ever so slightly. So the bird's just looking towards the camera. I find that makes the best connection. And that's what number six and eight give me. And here's the final image of number eight, which is what I consider to be great contact. Did you also pick number eight? Perhaps let me know in the comments below. Here's another little test for you to try out, this time of a rainbow bee eater. So all three shots were taken within seconds of each other. So the same perch, same light, same photographer, everything's the same, the only difference is the slight head angle and the eye contact. Which of these three do you prefer? Obviously, if we have a look at the one on the left, that's no good, that's an instant delete. The heads are turning away from the sensor. We don't have eye contact. The middle image, that's pretty good. That's kind of a field ID shot. It's almost perfectly parallel to the sensor. And it's, it's not bad, but it's not the best. If we have a look at the one on the right, that one's just turning in ever so slightly, and it makes more of a connection in my opinion. And that's the image I ultimately went with. So very subtle differences, but they are differences and that can make a difference. And that's what we're trying to achieve when we're out in the field, capturing lots of images so we can get just that right head turn and eye contact. I kind of alluded to it, but how do we get these good head angles? Well, basically you just have to take a lot of photos. Birds will naturally move around a lot when you're photographing them. They move from front to back, side to side, up and down, all over the place. So you just have to try and predict which is gonna be the best pose and which has the best eye contact. Often the shutter will be enough for the bird to slightly turn its head towards you because it wants to know what that noise is. But don't think for a minute that every time I go out, I get perfect head angle and eye contact. It's just simply not the case. Sometimes the bird's only there for a split second and what you get is what you get. But ultimately trying to get that right eye contact is the goal and what we strive for, but it's not always achievable. And sometimes you might get a bird that's more intent on sleeping <laughs> than actually opening its eyes like this little red cap plover. And it really wasn't bothered by me at all. So 
I just had to wait until the bird was finished dozing and it got up and went for a walk and I was able to get some other types of shots. Before I move on to a pose, I don't want you to think you have to have a side profile with the head this way to get a good shot. That's not the case at all. Uh, you can definitely get good eye contact with birds, say, coming towards you, like this chestnut teal. The head's slightly turned, but we've definitely got eye contact. Uh, you've got owls, many raptors. A lot of these different species actually look really good from the front, and they deliver good eye contact. If we have a look at these two black-shouldered kite shots, the one on the left definitely has eye contact. It's almost piercing. You almost feel like this bird is staring straight into you, and that's a really good connection. But the image on the right I like too, and it doesn't really have any eye contact at all. We can see the eye, but it's obvious the bird's not looking at us. And that's because the bird is doing what raptors do. It's sitting on a perch, scanning the ground, looking for mice and other things. And as a viewer, I think we understand that, and we know that that's what raptors do, and it's expected behavior. So it just works. We make a connection because we believe we're watching the bird hunting, and that's a type of behavior, which is what we're after. So that works for me as well. So don't be afraid to try lots of different things and just see what you prefer and what you like. That's what it's all about. So sometimes, due to the light angle, you'll get shadows on the bird's eye. That's generally if the sun's from your right or from your left. It'll cast shadows like on this Jackie Winter, and there's not a lot you can do. You can lift the shadows, but it just doesn't look as good as actual direct sunlight. So just be sure that the sun's coming over your shoulder and you're pointing your own shadow towards the bird, and you're far less likely to get shadows on the bird's face. All right, now that we've got eye contact sorted, let's move on to the pose of the bird. There's a myriad of different poses and it'd be almost impossible for me to show you all the different poses. So I just want to focus on the poses that reveal the bird's best features. What makes the bird look the best? One way we can figure that out is to look in the field guide or any bird art. Artists seem to have a really great way of identifying which poses bring out the best in a bird. The most common is the side profile shot that you can see in these two beautiful paintings from the 1800s. You can also notice the great eye contact, so even painters were aware you needed eye contact. I think we can learn a lot from art, and many of these birds' poses can be recreated in photographs. And here's an example of a hooded plover photograph imitating art. As you can see, a side profile shot is a great way of capturing the details of a species. Alright, I've put on the screen the four most common poses for perch birds. Those being the side profile with the tail in front and behind the perch, the back and the front view. Most poses will be a variation of these four. And it can depend on the species for which pose suits what bird. And that's up to you to figure out. Some birds will have red on their belly or red on their back, or they have something distinctive that you really need to capture. So here's a few examples of side profiles that I really like. The first one's of a Mallee ringneck. The tail's in front of the perch, and we can get a lot of detail from the back, the wings, the tail, the head, and just overall, the bird to me looks really good and is a good representation of the bird's features. So this female fairy wren is also captured with a side profile and it's got its tail up, which is indicative of the species. I really like this pose and I believe it captures the fairy wren really well. So the side profile is also very common for birds that spend their time on the ground. So say ducks and shorebirds and that sort of thing. If we have a look at this pink-eared duck, which is an unusual duck we have here in Australia, you can really see the distinctive features of that pink ear and the zebra type stripes when we have a side profile. If it was coming straight at you, you might not see the pink and the stripes just as well. And waders are also another great species to capture sight on. You can see these red-necked avocets, you get to see their beautiful head and that amazing upturned bill which is very unique in that species. So if we looked at them front on, we might not get that upturned, which is very important in capturing this bird. So some species have very special characteristics that if you don't capture them, kind of lets down the photo. Have a look at this Major Mitchell cockatoo shot. It's not a bad photo, but it's a little bit boring. You can see the pink wash on its chest and on its head, but this bird has some stunning features that just aren't shown in this shot. If we compare that to this next shot which I've taken, now that shot really pops. You can see the crest in its full glory with all that colour, and even that magic colour under the wings. We just didn't get that in the first shot, but the second pose allowed us to sort of enjoy everything this bird has to offer. And that's up to us as photographers to capture that. So it's pretty amazing the difference between these two shots. Simply two different poses creates two dramatically different looking images. And that's ultimately what a lot of it comes down to when you're capturing bird images. It's the pose, the behavior, the action. It's just something different that makes the photo interesting. So another example is the beautiful red cap robin. It's got amazing red on its head and on its chest. And these are important features for this bird. 
If we look at the photo on the screen, I captured both these images in the same session. So if we look at the pose on the left, we would miss out on showing that incredible chest. But it's still a keeper for me because I want to keep different poses. But the photo on the right captures the chest and in my opinion is a much stronger image. So some birds are really well known for their singing and it's great to be able to capture a bird singing. So a superb fairy wren, the male will often find the highest perch and he'll sing defending his territory and just letting all the other birds know where he is. So of course I like to capture that behaviour and I've got a few photos of the birds singing. So I've been talking about perch birds and birds on the ground. Many of you probably really enjoy birds in flight. Whilst it's not my strongest type of photography, I've taken a number of shots over the years and there's certain poses which I believe work well for birds in flight. I've put six of them up on the screen at the moment and these are probably the most common shots you'll get for a bird in flight. So let's have a look at them. Number one is flying towards you and that's a really interesting image because we've got the feet down and the tail up. And number four is not too bad, it's sort of the horizontal. It's interesting because it's just above the water. So two and five are probably the weakest images of the six. They're just lacking a little bit in my opinion. Number three and number six, I really like the banking type poses where the wings are stretched, the bird's tilted towards the camera, the light is even across the bird. I just really like these images. But they can be tough to get because one of the hardest things in bird and flight is the shadows of the bird's wings. You have to be aware of where the sun's coming from and where you need to stand to try and eliminate those shadows in the pose. One thing I want to mention is that good photos are often more than just a good pose. They often have to have that something different, maybe some sort of behavior. And often that behavior trumps the pose. So if you can capture really good behavior, it often doesn't matter what pose the bird's doing because the behavior is so interesting. Take a look at these two sacred kingfisher shots on the screen. I much prefer the pose on the right because we get to see the beautiful blue back, we see the tail, and just overall it's quite a technically strong image. However, the image on the left just has that something extra. It has a giant spider in the bird's mouth and people are just drawn to that because it's unusual and it's different. We don't really care so much that the tail's hidden and it's just the front on view. That spider really makes a difference. Would I like the bird on the right to have the spider? 100%, I'd much prefer to have a really good pose with the spider that's what I'm striving for to get in my photos and that's a challenge for me going forward. All right, so we've looked at eye contact, we've looked at poses. Let's try and put that all together and see how we actually select an image once we've been in the field. I'll share with you the process that I go through and you might learn something from that. So a few videos ago, I photographed a lot of birds at F11 and I photographed a female flame robin on a perch. This is the photo that I actually showed in the video. I really like the eye contact and I really like that pose with the tail up, sort of a side profile. I just think this was a nice image. So why and how did I select this image? I selected this because I believe it had the strongest eye contact and pose of all the photos that I took. I actually ended up taking 129 different shots of this bird on a perch. That gave me lots of different poses to choose from. I actually go through all my images on the back of the camera and assign star ratings to the ones that I wanna keep. This isn't for everyone, but it works for me. So I went through all 129 images and only the images that were sharp, had a good pose, had good eye contact, would I even consider keeping. And of those 129, I ended up only keeping 15. And then I load those 15 onto the computer and I have a look at which ones I rated the best. So just in Lightroom, and it becomes obvious to me which poses are the strongest. And I ultimately pick two images. So of those 129, I only used two and processed two images. And these two were slightly different from one another, so they were both worth processing. So I hope you found this video interesting and it gave you insight into how I choose my images and what I think is good eye contact in a pose. Of course, you don't need to follow this to the letter. You can obviously try lots of creative things and different things, and that's a really exciting part of photography. But understanding the fundamentals of how to achieve a good image will definitely help you in the long run. So if you've hung around this long, thank you very much. I just thought I'd let you know that I've actually put up a new website and on that website I'm actually selling Christmas cards and gift cards. I sell these at markets and they do really well. And I've also put up some digital art and digital photos for sale that you can download yourself and print. I'll be adding to these as time goes on, but if you're interested in supporting the channel and supporting me, I would greatly appreciate it if you had the time to check out my website. All right, thanks for watching. If you like this content, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already, of course, leave comments below. I love the community that we've built and I love answering all your questions. So keep that going. But until next time, bye for now and we'll see you in the next video. So, sort of suits the composition on that branch. The pose isn't too bad. The tail, you can see, 
mosquitoes. So the po I quite like the pose and the of images so we can get just that right head turn and eye contact. <clears throat> Better take a drink. much talking I think. <laughs>